all the technical things? I, I think so. Okay. Let's start. Well, assuming that we are. Hello and good evening. Welcome to, welcome to the April 15, 2019 GBOS regular meeting. Uh, my name is Robert Snitzer, co-chair and PSAC supervisor. And to my left. Mike Edgerton, land use supervisor. Good evening, Christina Hendrickson, Parks and Recreation. Uh, Jerry Fox, fire supervisor. And Aaron is excused. Aaron Boone is excused. And the time is 7.04. Um, first up is agenda revisions and approval. So we'll start with tonight's agenda approval. I move to approve the agenda. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Approved. The April 14th, 2019 GBOS and PSAC joint work session meeting at minutes approval. April 15th. I'm unable to offer a motion. I was not present. I will move to approve. Second. All in favor? Christina abstains. The um, let the record show it approved. Uh, March 18, 2019, minutes approval. Make a motion to approve. Second. All in favor? I was not present. And it passes. And the March 27, 2019, GBOS special meeting minutes approval. Make a motion to approve. Second. And all in favor? And it passes. And the February 18th, 2019, regular meeting minutes approval. I guess we didn't have enough people last time. But there was a comment on it, so I would make a motion to approve. Second. All in favor? And Mike was excused from that meeting, and it passes. And the February 20th, 2019, GBOS special meeting minutes approval. This was on the first quarter revisions. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Christina abstains. And it passes. All right. For announcements, the public is encouraged to ask questions and provide comment. Please raise your hand and wait to be acknowledged. Please take side conversations to the foyer. GBOS Nonprofit Recreation Grant Cycle 2020 opens May 1st of 2019 and closes June 21st at 3 p.m. Applications will be available online at muni.org at the post office, library, and community room bulletin boards starting Wednesday, May 1st. MOA GBOS quarterly meeting is Monday, April 22nd at 4 p.m. in the Girdwood community room. Imagine. Girdwood meeting is Monday, April 29th at 6 p.m. at the school. The Open Meetings Act and Ethics Training is scheduled for Tuesday, April 30th at 7 p.m. in the Girdwood Community Room. Moving on to introductions, presentations, and reports. First up is the introduction of Mr. James Glover, Jr., the new GBS member to be, conform to be confirmed with certification of the municipal election tomorrow. We appreciate you volunteering and congratulations on your election victory. It was a tough campaign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a comment first. Please. So I think it would be good that we thank Robert for his six years of service. So Robert has been very even keeled through all of these six years of the ch most challenging issues. Why well, I wouldn't call him the most verbose member on the board. <laughs> Whenever he did sp speak, it was always well thought out. And it was always to the point. And many times I relied on Robert to get us out of challenging discussions and back to a productive point, and he was always good at that as co-chair. So I'd just like to thank Robert for being another example of a community member who volunteers his time while he's working up there at the resort for six years. And I think we should all give him a round of applause. <laughs> Now you won't have to do anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say, three-year break, and then you'll be ready for doing it again. Yeah, all right. All right. The next up is the subcommittee reports, uh, three minutes each. First up is the Trails Committee, Carolyn Broden. Hi, my name's Carolyn Broden, and I'm chair of Trails. Um, we had a nice, easy meeting last or this month. 
Um, I think I'll start off with that we did discuss the Girded Trails Master Plan. Uh, this is something that's just getting going. Um, it needs to be part of the Girdwood Area Plan. It's a pretty huge project. Uh, Christina has been doing some footwork on it. Uh, the things we discussed at our meeting is that we will are going to probably create a subcommittee to work on this because it'll take an awful lot of time. We wouldn't be able to have to, wouldn't be something we'd handle all the time at our meetings. And um, we also discussed hiring a consultant for this project to help organizing and moving the effort forward. Let's see. Let's take it out here. Um, oh, as mentioned in um, Kyle's report. Uh, we are going to have for our June and July meetings, we're going to do work parties instead of regular meetings, and we're going to determine our June project at the May meeting. Um, we're also going to schedule, hopefully, a, a work party here in Gerdo to the Alaska Trails um, program. They are very successful at creating nice big work parties, and they did some great projects in the Valley last summer. Um, let's see. But, um, we uh, did get some updates. Well, uh, Gerber North Ski Club, they're only, we didn't, they didn't really have an update other than that they were going to decide if the Ski Meister race was going to be on, and um, I guess it isn't going to be on, sadly, due to lack of snow. <laughs> um, Gerber Mountain Bike Alliance, they plan to submit their packet to the UDC in May for the July meeting, and um, taking it from there for their uh, proposed bike park. We did get a uh, report from Christina that, from GBOS that I'm sure that'll be discussed. We mostly talked about the pedestrian crosswalk flashing light, which we'll be talking about tonight. Um, as everybody's getting back out on the trails now, please report any downed trees or other ma trail maintenance you see along the way. Um, you can report it to Kyle and Margaret and we'll organize work efforts to get that cleaned up. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is the Girdwood Area Plan update with Erica Fullerton and or Janice Crocker. Eric? Thank you. Uh, we had a very productive meeting last week. Uh, we elected a secretary to help us take minutes for publishing on various public channels in anticipation of tonight's resolution, which is later on the agenda being approved. Uh, and that's Amanda Sassy, so she's going to be helping us with that. Um, we still will be meeting in this room, as far as I know, and that hasn't changed yet, unless anyone disagrees with that. Um, and uh, typically the fourth Thursday of every month uh, will be in this room. And that'll start up in May. Uh, a lot of planning went into and discussions about our presentation for the new uh, what we're doing, like we're calling it Imagine Girdwood, which is our town hall, if you will, where we're inviting the community out to uh, share some treats with everyone and bring their family and, and uh, have an interactive uh, experience learning about the survey results, but also asking some more in-depth questions about relevant issues that um, are important for us for making the new Girdwood area plan for the next 20 years for Girdwood. Uh, You'll probably be seeing the event on Facebook and also some flyers being circulated about that. So please like and share that so everybody has the best opportunity to be aware that this is going on because one of the major tasks of this committee is making sure that we have as much community engagement in this process as possible. Uh, I think that's the bulk of it because the rest is the um, the resolution. Uh, the only other thing, I, I read this into the minutes of our last meeting and I just want to make sure it's clear so everyone is clear as how we are guided about how we're developing the uh, the 2020 or the 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 20 year plan for um, the Girdwood area plan, it's based on um, guidelines provided by us um, from the municipality planning department and the outline of that is as follows. Uh, every plan, regardless of form and content, shall include a discussion of its long range consequences, impact on economic and housing opportunity for all persons, particularly low end, moderate, in moderate income and persons with disabilities, provision of future growth and development opportunities, ability to improve the physical environment, and effect on the geographic distribution of municipal facilities. A plan shall set forth goals, objectives, purposes, policy, strategies, and or recommendations with the legal authority of the municipality. A plan sh 
considering issues under the jurisdiction of specific municipal and state agencies shall disclose all agency comments. A plan shall analyze its relationship to applicable policy documents, including all adopted elements in the comprehensive plan, as well as its relationship to the adjoining neighborhoods and other areas. And a plan shall solicit input from residents, local businesses, agencies, and nonprofit organizations local to the neighborhood and demonstrate it has considered these comments in their merits. So that's all I have. Any questions? Awesome. Thank you, Eric. The Land Use Committee, Brian Burnett. Good evening, everybody. Um, the Girdwood Land Use Committee had our regularly scheduled monthly meeting on, on April 8th. We heard from the committees, all of the committees that we'll be hearing from again tonight, so I don't need to summarize those for us. We had some uh, agenda items and old business to consider. Um, the uh, Girdwood area plan requested for the LUC to recommend that GBOS revise a resolution of support for the Girdwood area plan. We'll be hearing about that later on this evening. Eric and Janice will be um, presenting and the Girdwood Land Use Committee moved to recommend that GBOS write a resolution of support for the Girdwood area plan update to state that the Girdwood area plan is no longer a subcommittee Committee of GBOS and operates independently of government that carried unanimously by a vote of 10 to 0 at our meeting. Um, the next item that we considered at land use was Spoons LLC application for a beer wine liquor license for the restaurant. And the Girdwood Land Use Committee moved to recommend that GBOS write a letter of non-objection for Spoons LLC application for a beer wine license. That motion also carried unanimously, 10 to nothing at the, um, at the meeting. And then we moved into new business and uh, Mike Edgington um, uh, provided us with a, uh, a document on uh, changes to the municipal code regarding accessory dwelling units and I believe that we're going to be covering that again this evening so uh, we can let that one we can wait for that later on this evening and so it was a uh, fairly quick land use committee meeting and um, look forward to seeing everybody in May second Monday of May Great. thank you Brian Next up is the legislative report. Uh, Jennifer Johnson, Kathy Geisel, John Wendleton, Susan LaFrance. Obviously, I'm not Suzanne herself. Um, <laughs> Suzanne uh, wanted to come to this meeting tonight, but she is uh, doing a rather interesting thing. Um, she's at an organize organization meeting for a girls unit of the Boy Scouts. It's a very interesting thing, but a relatively new development. So, being a mom is full time, as you can tell. So I'm here again. A uh, couple of things on the agenda. I know uh, smoking was one big thing. They simply did pass. Thank God, but they did pass a ban on smoking within 20 foot, of, 20 feet of a playground and municipal property. Fairly non-objectionable. Still took a little longer than should have happened, but. That's done. The other ordinances that we're dealing with smoking, including one that was introduced, um, those were all pushed until June 4th. These are ordinances that are going to get wrapped together to deal comprehensively with um, e-cigarettes, vaping, flavors, um, and raising the age of consumption and purchase from 19 to 21 in the municipality. Um, they want to write a good, res a good ordinance and give some proper time into this to make sure we don't have uh, uh, unintended consequences, particularly with uh, employment, um, such as at grocery stores or gas stations where they may sell cigarettes and that could block anybody under 21 from being able to work there. So they really want to make sure to get that right. Uh, another one that may be of interest in this area, considering the joy we've had with bears the last year or so, um, 
Suzanne is co-sponsoring an ordinance um, that's being led by Pete Peterson of East Anchorage. It, the number is AO 2019-50. Um, Suzanne just mailed it, uh, emailed it to the Board of Supervisors so you guys have the physical ones. Um, essentially what this would do, it, was, it would bar trapping on municipal parkland within 50 yards from a trailhead, from a trail and a quarter mile from trailheads and residential property. Essentially, this means that wherever trapping would still be allowed in the municipality would be far away from people and dogs and children. Um, right now, you can trap on portions of it, and I think most of us have been hiking, have run across a mama moose and a calf, and have gotten off of the trail to give wide berth. Um, if you walk too far off, you could possibly step right into some of those traps. Dogs are off on the trails. Um, especially you know, well-behaved dogs, it's a pretty common sight. Children run off the trails. This is just something that we're kind of waiting for a particularly bad situation to happen. Plus, you don't want to be attracting bears right toward where everybody is. That's just a recipe for disaster. There's a work session on that this Friday. Uh, yeah, that one's Friday. Mm -hmm. This Friday at noon, and that'll be at City Hall, probably in the assembly's usual room, but the folks <coughs> at the front will tell you exactly where it is and where to go. Uh, first quarter budget revisions are up. SAP is, for the most part, completely operational, so they actually have all of their numbers and can do something with them. Now, uh, the work session for that is going to be right after the work session on the trapping ordinance, so that's going to be at 1 o'clock in the same room. Uh, there seems to be a very small fund balance, but between what's going on at the state level and um, how that could impact the municipality's finances, uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, if there's anything uh, that the Board of Supervisors wants, I would definitely recommend putting in a word in um, tonight, basically. Uh, that'll be taken up. All of these will be coming up um, on the 23rd at the next regular assembly meeting for a public hearing. So if they are something that are, um, or there are subjects that are important to you, or you want to make sure to have a voice in, the assembly meeting starts at 5 you could probably safely plan to arrive around 6.30, um, especially if the agenda is kind of crammed. Uh, Heritage Land Bank's work plan is 2 p.m. on the work session this Friday. They del um, delayed that to be able to give some final looks at it. I don't think we had any comments, so if there was anything, even if it's just non-objection, um, that's one thing also, kind of one last chance to get that in. And then this is kind of a side note. And I'm going to be very charitable to John since he's not here tonight. Um, the state recently, uh, the Lieutenant Governor signed the first on-site marijuana consumption regulations in the United States. Um, that's up to local municipalities, however, to de decide whether they want to allow it and how they want to regulate it. There's no pending ordinances or legislation or anything even in the works right now, but the discussion's gotten started. And John chairs the commi Community and Economic Development Committee where marijuana issues are handled. If there are any thoughts, anything that kind of get contribute to the conversation at this early stage, just want to make sure that you all know how to do that. I definitely send those to John, um, especially if you own or visit a cannabis dispensary. You know, um, this is a fairly exciting development because this will be the first, this will be Alaska for the first time in our history with legalized cannabis really actually stepping ahead of the rest of the country. So there's very little precedent and we'll pretty much be designing it, you know, based on our own needs and best data we have. I okay, hit everything. Is there any questions I can have or anything to take back to Suzanne? I have a question that I was going to ask Carolyn, but I'll ask you. Because, it, well, it's the announcement the federal grants for nonprofits mm -hmm. that goes to trails is not going to be going to trails, and it's going to be going to, this is a state thing, it's going to be going to state park maintenance, is my understanding. Oh, yeah, I saw that in the paper. I didn't read that. Paper. I think that's the RTP grant. That's RTP, yes. The yeah, RTP yes. grants. So what I'm wondering is if you hear anything in Anchorage, or we hear anything here, is there some sort of groove forming? Because this is going to be an issue for Soldatna, for Anchorage, for Girdwood, for the Valley. All these communities use these grants. I mean, the Valley uses them for snow machine maintenance trails. You know, we use those grants here. Soldatna uses it on the Teshi, um, I can't ever pronounce it, but their cross country trails and running trails down there behind the high school. So 
if there's anybody that's forming a group or if we can get a group kind of statewide going, that would be probably a good thing to push back against this. So is there a group forming? I'm not aware of any. Um, obviously, I think we've all been keeping or likely been keeping track of what's been going on in Juneau to the best possible. Um, just to give you an idea of the level of uncertainty, house finance, since something that completely got, did away with all bond reimbursement for school debt, which would have seen property taxes here go up $120 automatically per 100,000 of your assessed value. Then they restored 50% of it, then they passed the budget with that, and now we have the Senate, and we have no idea what the Senate's going to do, we have no idea what the governor is going to do, and that's just to give an example on education. So with deferred maintenance, I, I have no idea. I'm not stunned that that's the tack the state is taking. Um, but if you hear anything, just yeah. keep your ear open. That's all I'm asking. You can start the group, I mean. Yeah, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I had actually meant to bring that up, and I forgot to write it in my notes, and then I forgot to. But yeah, um, I think it's pretty much a, a done deal, but I don't. A lot of public comment would probably help. I can't hurt. <laughs> Those grants are so important to so many people. Jerry, I can assure you it'll be a hot topic at the Alaska Trails Statewide Trails Conference uh, this next weekend. Oh, there you go. And yes. maybe a group could be formed there. Yes. Well, yeah. that's what Alaska Trails is. Yeah, yeah. but I, yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, There's a, a whole group fundraising thing. track yeah. uh, for that trails. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Obviously, <laughs> Senator Giesel is Senate president, so she's always a good one to contact. But I would definitely contact the senators on the Senate Finance Committee, and the committee itself has it. The Senate budget, operating budget, is still in their committee with the final workings on it. Um, really, that'll be the last chance outside of conference. And conference, I have a feeling, just knowing they need to get this thing done as quickly as possible they're pretty much gonna bury themselves in a room, hammer out the differences to what can pass both chambers and then zoom back and pass them as fast as possible. So time is definitely of the essence if there's anything in the state budget. It's not an official position from Suzanne on the assembly, but just from someone who's been watching this happen. So I have a question about a, um, an, an ordinance that's going through the system of being proposed, mm -hmm. which is uh, to rationalize and fix some of the issues with trash. Uh, so a trash ordinance, which includes um, uh, some stuff about uh, mandating bear resistant containers in certain areas. Um, that's something we've passed a resolution on to push for. Do you know anything about where that currently stands? Since I know John has been the one John that is- John is the one who's primarily looking at it, but he's not here. I was going to Yes, I know. So you're him not to tell me. Um, I don't know what's going on. I can definitely tell John to get, ah, well, ask okay. very, very nicely. But he will get back in touch. On the status of the bear ordinance, mm. because we're uh, we, we suddenly find ourselves in early summer. If you look outside. Oh yeah, I would. I wouldn't have been surprised if there wasn't a quorum or anybody here. It was just too nice to say. <laughs> Anything else? I got to start bringing more controversial topics. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Next is the Garris Library report with Claire Agney. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Agney, I'm the Garish Library Manager. Garish Library was open for 164 hours and had 2,770 visitors for the month of March. Uh, great news, our seed library is open. We have dozens of varieties of free seeds for you to pick up. They're just, when you uh, walk into the library, they're right there. Pick up as many as you like. Uh, we'll probably buy more soon because they're going really fast. If you have seeds you'd like to donate, you're free to drop them off at the front desk. If you could let us know how old they are so we can put that on the package, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, seed library, take them, drop them off, whatever you like. And we'll have more gardening programs coming up, um, mostly in June, so I'll mention that next month. But let's see, this Friday, we're having a Peeps taste test. I know Eric is very excited for that. Uh, I've never had a peep, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, Friday at 3.30, Peeps taste test. Uh, this Saturday at 12 is our final We Be Jammin' for the season. It's our music and uh, movement story time for kids five and under. We don't do it in the summer, 
So last one until probably September. That's this Saturday at 12. And Saturday the 27th from 1 to 3 is our third annual paint and plant. So it's our gardening program for kids. Uh, they'll paint pots and plants a sunflower seed to take home. It's really fun and hopefully if it's nice we can do it outside. So that's Saturday the 27th uh, from 1 to 3 paint and plant. Kids of all ages and their parents are welcome to come. Uh, a reminder, we do proctoring. If you're taking a class um, either online or in town and you'd like to take a test here instead of driving in, contact me and we'll set it up. So proctoring at the Garish Library. As always, follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash APLGarish. Any questions? All right, thanks. Thank you, Claire. Next up is the Gerber Manager Report by Margaret. Not quite, Kyle. Or should you say employee, municipal employee of the year? Yes. Yeah. Ooh, I should miss say. <laughs> <laughs> you missed it, Ashley. <laughs> There's a giant crown yeah. on my head. Uh, that was the head of the <laughs> um, We have exciting things to let you know of. We do have our summer seasonal position posted right now, and it's posted for two weeks starting last Wednesday, so this week and then halfway into next week, so please encourage people to apply. It's 30 hours a week. It can pay up to just about 20 an hour and you do have to join the union in order to take the position. So if there's a little bit of paperwork and a little bit of other stuff, we'd really like to get that person working mid-May, although we need them now. So, um, so we have that. We have Emily Maxwell moving back in as our campground host. We're very excited to have her. I want to pick out a camper today in case you talk to him. I'm really nice. Tell him, tell him we're happy to have him in the community, just not camping there. Um, the fathers and sons are going to come back and work in the park in May. Uh, this year, instead of spreading wood chips in the playground, as they've done the last couple years, they're going to probably spread gravel in the campground and make it nice for the rest of the season. We're going to be doing annual spring planting. All of those 700 beautiful plants that come from the Muni greenhouse need to get in the ground on June 1st. And given how quickly we're getting spring here, we think that that's going to work out pretty well. So if you wanna join us for that, we'll get together at 10 a.m. in Town Square Park, give people their assignments, send them off, and then we'll do a barbecue afterwards. Um, if anybody really wants to use their creative genius to plan how the plants are going to come in and where we're going to put them, I would love help. So I'd be happy to turn that over to somebody. Um, the baseball field is clear and we are requesting that people not put their pets on the field any longer for the season so that our kids can play baseball without extra bonuses. We have other people-only park facilities in the Little Bears playground, the soccer field technically, although if you scoop your poop, you'll probably be welcome there. The tennis courts, that'd be nice, and the skate park. So please keep your animals off of those areas. Um, other exciting news is that ski trail grooming is done for the season, but we want to thank Shane Bolin for doing summer maintenance on the grooming machines and definitely thank you to the Nordic Ski Club for all their work all winter long. We made them amazing for as long as they possibly could have been. The hand tram is still closed. I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> it's going to take us a little while. The trail just is or was really icy. Um, and the uh, parking lot wasn't even plowed until recently. So we haven't gotten out there yet. We do have a little bit of maintenance we want to do on the shivs, I think. Is that what it is, Brian? They want to regroove the shivs, I think, for the hand trim. So we do actually have maintenance to do on that. And then we also need to have an inspection. So we're looking at mid-May, hopefully, hopefully earlier than Memorial Day weekend. But um, it's our goal. Uh, the campground is currently closed and also opening mid-May after those fathers and sons get done making it nicer. Um, the GBOS, as you heard at the start of this, has their 2020 nonprofit grant cycle coming up. Um, the applications are going to be available starting May 1st and we'll be uh, announcing that through the Muni we're required to announce it for two full weeks before we make it available. So 
gives you lots of time to start thinking of your awesome projects. As far as grants that we have acquired or are trying to acquire, we have a KMTA grant for $17,000 to work on the Lower Iditarod California Creek Bridge. Um, and we applied and won a grant for just under $5,000 for some trail tools. And one of those trail tools is going to be this power wheelbarrow to get materials into some of our more difficult sites. <coughs> and then we also have some crazy other things. What are they? The McLeod and they all have these very tough sounding names. So KMTA loves to see student involvement in these things. So we're joking about taking some great pictures of kids more or less holding these pieces of equipment. Maybe we can put one in the power wheelbarrow. <laughs> we will make them laugh. Um, we did receive $75,000 in the RTP grant for this year. Um, we're going to spend it really fast because <laughs> we don't want to see anything happen to it. But uh, that money is secure and actually technically we have two years to use it. Um, and that will be to bring the trail up to, from the California Creek Bridge up to where Ruane would be if Ruane went all the way through to the back of that property at the industrial park. Um, we also, on Friday, applied for an uh, Anchorage Park Foundation grant. Um, and for that one, we're looking for $15,000, and that is to, that's a matching one-to-one -one grant. And it would bring us from where the trail is going to end when we're done with the RTP grant up to Corolius. So that would bring that trail as a class four trail all the way up pretty much to the town site. And then at that point, I think we're probably going to be kind of in a holding pattern while we figure out funding and also figure out the ownership and getting an easement through the rest of this area to go up past the school and connect ultimately to uh, other trails. Um, we also applied for $1,000 for trail tr tools to match um, with the Alaska Community Foundation. So those would just go toward that other purchase. Um, we are active on Facebook. We have a brand new website at the Muni, and I'm going to learn how to use it tomorrow. So, so <laughs> keep, a, keep an eye out. Hopefully we'll be able to put things on our website by noon. Um, let's see. In the cemetery committee land, um, they met on April 4th. They are closing out the schematic design report, um, and so things are moving along with just finishing that phase of the project. The committee is going to continue working on uh, operating guidelines and rules for the facility once it is built, and then they're also trying to help shepherd things along with Eagle River. I guess I could have left that for you, I'm sorry. Do you have anything else you want to add about that? Okay. Um, Moving on to roads, this is the part that I've only just read. Um, I know that Kyle has ordered calcium and it should be delivered by the end of this month. The um, roads crew has been doing lots of work all around town. I know today they did a lot of pothole patching. They also helped me with a couple of projects. Um, so they're definitely out there and they're busy. Um, since the last GBOS meeting, they've been working on slow and sn snow and slush, the, uh, getting the piled ice up off the roads, which is hard to imagine anymore. Lots of dirt grading, sweeping, brushing, all the rest of that. Let them know that you love them. Mm -hmm. They make things much better. Um, as far as big projects that we have coming up, the Little Bears Project, we're having a lot of fun kind of pushing that along. It's pretty exciting. Um, right now, it is estimated to cost about $2 million. Um, the project is likely to be on the, as entered as a bond proposition in the 2020 election, which means that we need to have a lot of homework done by the fall of this year in order to, to make that work. Um, we're working with the um, Burkhart Croft, which is an engineer, I'm sorry, an architect firm in Anchorage to put together some 25% concept plans so that everybody here can kind of see what we're planning on. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, the flasher system we're going to just talk about later. Um, as far as funding goes, the undesignated balance 
undesignated fund balance is 198,000. We have spent 35,000 in March on the roads. So far this year, we've spent 129,000 on the roads. Uh, Public Works is at 17% of their budget. Parks is at 5% of their budget, but I get expensive later. <laughs> so don't worry, we'll get there. Um, the fund balances, um, 68,000 in the Capital Park project, 74,000 in the community room, and for the pedestrian crosswalk light, at this point we have 143,000 encumbered. Um, police are at 6% of their budget, I'm guessing we're going to see a bill pretty soon, and the fire department's at 33% of their budget. So far. I think. I have one question. The, um, the RTP grant, you said that comes from basically California Creek, Creek up to Rouen. Mm -hmm. Is that including the bridge? The bridge? Well, the bridge is not part of the RTP project, no, okay. because RTP can't pay for steel. Okay. So it is an American. Is the bridge still being done? Is the bridge is being done, but it's being done with the KMTA oh, okay. grant. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Clarify for me. Yeah. We'll put kids in that video and picture too. I'll say thanks for putting up the tennis courts. The oh, nets. yeah. Yeah, the tennis nets are up and we'll do yeah. the windscreens. A little bit later, it seems like just last week, we had some pretty good gusting winds, so we have lots of zip ties waiting. So that will be a nice volunteer project. What will the surface, what will the trail look like coming from the California Bridge up this way? It'll be the same as the lower part of it, the part that was redone last year. So it's going to get some bigger rock underneath, and there'll be trail fabric, bigger rock, and then smaller rock compacted. The plan is for that to be you know, uh, a trail with really good sight lines. It's going to be six feet wide. It's um, prescripted by the Forest Service, who will eventually take the trail over for maintenance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything? Okay. Moving on to supervisor reports. And first up is public safety with myself. And a lot of this is gonna be addressed in item agenda item number 16 later, so I won't get too much detail, but we did get um, a number back from Whittier Police Department at a rate of I believe 675K a year for a three-year contract. And so that seemed very favorable to us. Um, and we will talk about that more in item 16. One other piece of news is we have a brand new interim Whittier Public Safety Director, Mr. Andre Ache, and he would be up next with a police report. I do not believe he's present. Um, do we have any other PSAC representatives who would like to speak? Hearing none, um, move on to roads and utilities. Aaron, not present. Um, anything on behalf of Margaret of Roads and Utilities? Okay. No. Um, parks and Recreation, Christina. Thank you. I was absent from uh, the previous meetings in April because I took a well-deserved break down to some warmth in Red Rocks and Vegas and went climbing without my cell phone for two and a half weeks. It was wonderful. Um, as such, got to listen to lots of notes and I appreciate everybody who sent me emails when I gave updates in my memos to those meetings and asked for input on the pedestrian lights, etc. Um, and just want to keep open the dialogue that anytime you have comments, uh, whether it be about something on the agenda or something coming up, please feel free to email me. My email is uh, accessible on the uh, GBOS website. Um, that said, I want to reiterate a couple of items. One, uh, there is the uh, Imagine Girdwood uh, that Eric briefed us on earlier. That's a town hall meeting, and I will be there to take some comments um, and take into consideration some of the trail-heavy specific information that came out of those surveys. We're very interested in learning about that because, as uh, Carolyn said earlier, I am working towards a solution to find some sort of 
trails, and I'm going to call it master plan with finger quotes for those in radio land um, for the future. To do that based on the lack of funding we're getting from other sources, I am looking at different partnerships with not only our federal neighbors, um, but also leveraging some information that has been done previously, such as the trails management plan done a couple of years ago and the success it's had in d demonstrating and documenting what we have available. So uh, be advised that that's going to come up. I'm working towards a, a possible request for proposal with Kyle and again also looking for a potential consultant to help facilitate the meetings. Um, if you are interested in being part of how Girdwood looks, go to not only the Girdwood area plans, imagine Girdwood, but also think about uh, joining the subcommittee for this trails master plan. Uh, we definitely need people to step up. I promise I won't ask you to do it this summer. It'll be this fall by the time we get our act together. Um, but if you are interested, please, by all means, let me know. And then, again, if you are interested in having 30 hours a week and working in the sunshine here in Girdwood and helping out, uh, that position is available on the Muni website. Uh, please apply, or if you have somebody that needs uh, some Girdwood Brewery uh, beer money, by all means, have them uh, apply. And then, uh, last but not least, I wanted to um, thank the uh, cemetery committee for all the work that it's been doing and, and it's wrap up and I'm looking forward to doing a presentation to the Muni um, next week during our meeting on the 22nd. Thank you. Christina, thank you. Next up is the fire department. Question. Oh, I'm sorry, I did not see. Um, if I wanted to make a comment on the waiting rights, when is the appropriate time to do that? Well, we have, a, it's on the agenda. Oh, We're talking about okay, the, it's on the agenda. Yes, okay. Yep. All right, sorry I moved on so hastily. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> um, next up is fire department. Jerry? I will let the chief give chief an update. Hello. Hello, Michelle Weston, fire chief. Um, uh, just a few things. Uh, we are on run number 158 uh, for the year. Um, we made it through Slush Cup with only about three uh, inebriated people related calls. So that was pretty good. Um, and only two transports, so really good, no car accidents. Uh, so good, good on that. A lot of people were walking around at 3 a.m., but uh, they were walking, which was perfect. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, uh, other than that, uh, we do have 16 new firefighters, uh, eight of which are from our Girdwood community, starting this spring in two sort of waves. Um, so if you know one of them, uh, thank them for their service or their future service uh, to our community. Um, we are tra transitioning. We're losing about five people this uh, spring to other jobs and life and uh, that. Uh, but a few are coming back in about six months. So, uh, so we're losing some but gaining some. And so net... We're still ahead. At the end, we're still ahead by about uh, eight, I think. Um, other than that, uh, just uh, four of us were down in Juneau uh, for the last week working uh, side by side with the National Guard on urban structure collapse practice. Uh, so we had two firefighters learning how to jackhammer and stabilize buildings and build cribbing structure. Um, the rest of us were learning how to do detailed search, um, search management and search incident management from people who had been at the World Trade Center, the shuttle collapse, Katrina and that. So really, really fabulous, all fully grant funded. Um, and it was really nice to be in Juneau because Juneau is very much like us. They have big snow loads, they have avalanches, they have a great community, and they have big trees So very, and a lot of rain. So they're actually a really good uh, community for us to partner with on training. Um, so that went really well. And CERT, uh, CERT, the CERT topic on April 29th at 7 p.m., hopefully in here. I think Margaret, or yes, in here, um, will be uh, wildfires and how to prep your home for a wildfire season. It is wildfire season. There was a, I think about a 20, 30 acre fire in Palmer on the weekend. Um, there's a brush fire behind Ben Bokey right now from an exploding propane tank, or at least it was when I walked in the room. Um, and uh, so uh, it's time to think about wildfires. We've never had wildfires in our community, but um, it's not to say that this year we couldn't. So um, the Anchorage Municipal Forester is coming down on the 29th. And so uh, you can learn about how to uh, prep your home for wildfires also. 
since I've done that for 15 years as a evacuated people, I can, I'll be also there to give tips on how to uh, prepare your home for wildfires. And we have 25 wonderful people, including some in this room that are CERT members. So thank you. And you might have seen the Kenai CERT on the TV, both Kenai and Fairbanks CERT practiced uh, in Alaska Shield doing their exercises and evacuations. So that's what I have. Any questions? Uh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I have two quick questions. Uh, one is uh, the CERT thing, is that late enough for people to do the Imagine Girdwood event first and then come over to the CERT train? What, what time is the Imagine Girdwood? 6, 6, 6, 6, 6 to 8. 6 to 8. We have a hard stop. We, you want us to make it later? 7.30? Are people going to event hop? hop? I would hope so. Hope so. Would. would they? I'm sure they have come in. Well, time. we can make it 8. But I, I don't want to compete with you. I don't want to compete with you, right? So, so yeah, but we could make, yeah, they could, if they come over here, I mean, the cert, we just have to move the cert meeting a little, little bit later. So we moved cert from the normal Monday because it was Easter. So, yeah, yeah. Um, along, that, along those lines, I should mention, um, tomorrow, the crew that did the mud rescue are getting uh, Alaska Red Cross uh, Marine Award uh, at the Real Heroes Breakfast in the morning at 6.30 or 7 o'clock in Anchorage so that's kind of cool uh, and there's a very cool video that goes along that and I'll post that on our social media when it comes out um, and Red Cross has because they loved the CERT people when they came here especially Michael Palka they loved you <laughs> at the CERT training <laughs> they mentioned you specifically and because of that um, they're actually giving us 50 to 100 cots and blankets that we can use uh, to fill up the trailer so I thought that was a big score just because and they mentioned Mike specifically <coughs> as being wonderful so um, anyway so uh, that's it for me unless I need yeah, sorry, questions. I two questions. Yep. first one was about that the second thing was about parking and slush cut was it better this year? Oh was dear God! <laughs> you shouldn't have I'm brought that up. I'm only doing positive stuff. I'm only doing positive stuff. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so it, it was better. You shouldn't have brought it up. I, uh, I didn't bring it up. Brian, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so at, <laughs> at three at two thirty. All the parking was full, the church was full, Alyeska was full, so everybody loaded into the community, at which point a large part of, I think it's Alyeska base in that side, that subdivision was completely impassable. All, and then um, we had 10 hydrants that had people parking in front of them, and I got grumpy, and I got very grumpy and I started towing people and then AFD said don't tow people so I said okay but I can't like I think what we need to do for next year not to be negative about this year is so for next year I think we need to and for Forest Fair is we need to pile on along every place where there's a hydrant um, and because when I looked at Troutner's house he had put pylons out and no one had parked there. So um, so I think we should do the same for the hydrants. And then we need to also pile on or something down one side of the road on each street. Because if we just pile on down one side of the road, preferably the one with the hydrants on it, then we could at least get an emergency vehicle down. Because basically during Slush Cup, for those few hours, only maybe two or three, um, there were uh, Cortina, Davos, all those streets we couldn't move any uh, LES to view Garmish uh, we couldn't move any ambulance or any um, fire truck down I could kind of squeeze through with the suburban but that was it so if we'd had like a child that had a problem or um, you know god forbid a fire because it would have been suddenly a giant fire because we wouldn't be able to get any water there um, it would have been a bad thing so I'd rather we figure out a way that we can, because the signage, nobody did anything, nobody adhered to the signage whatsoever. So they did initially until all the spots went away and then they were like, ha, ah, we park anywhere. We don't care, we don't live here. So we gotta figure out something to do, which I think is more just saying, okay, you can load on one side of the road and maybe having a plan for the school of how to shuttle people better because it's just it's super popular which is fabulous if it was you know not on both sides of the road so to change that frown and put it upside down which is what i'm trying to do which uh, is why i didn't even say it <laughs> <laughs> that was earthquake preparedness day well 
And now we're on a different topic. Earthquake Prepared to Stay was fabulous, done by the school. Uh, CERT was out in force, as was the Red Cross, and I would say there was, what, 60 people there? Yeah, and it was fabulous. So, um, and the video, the movie that they've done is fabulous, and so if you want to see the kids' uh, movie about the earthquake in 64, it's great. Do we have a hand up back there? Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Chief. <laughs> Next up is land use, Mike. Right, I don't think I have any topics on land use in general. Um, the housing working group we're working on, I'm doing these in reverse order. Um, we're working now on four things. Uh, the ADU changes I'll be talking about later. Um, we're still slowly working through and discussing possible approaches to the balance of short-term versus long-term rentals in the community. Um, we're looking at uh, potential grants we can get from the federal government for infrastructure and currently how those grants, some of the grants are coming to Anchorage and how they're being used within Anchorage. So whether we can partner it there. And the new item we're looking at is, um, I'm going to call it a housing trust, but it's a bit more general than that, about whether we can set up or what the options are for setting up some sort of economic thing you know, either something analogous to a bank or a trust or something else that can provide um, a way to sort of invest within the housing options within this community. So, and this isn't necessarily building new things, it's fixing old things potentially as well. So there's a number of things going on around that area. So we're very active, there's a lot going on. Join us the Wednesday after land use. Um, chapter 29, uh, sorry, Title 29, Chapter nine meeting, we'll still be focusing on parking. We've gone through a bunch of study and analysis of the parking situations here. We think we've got a very strong case for changes. We have a proposed proposal for changes. Um, we're gonna start pushing that through the public process next month. So we'll be presenting at land use next month and uh, GBOS next month and then again the month after. And then in parallel, we'll start going through the municipal process as well for the Title 21 changes. Okay, any questions? For public comment, persons offering public comment must state their full name and address. Public comment is limited to three minutes per person and must be on subjects not listed on the agenda. Sir, thanks. Uh, I'm John Gallup. Uh, 47 year resident of Girdwood, and I'd just like to start by thanking the board for their service to Girdwood. Uh, I know I've thanked Jerry and Mike personally, but the other two I don't know yet. And uh, I did my turn in the barrel, and it was certainly memorable. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, what I'd like to today, do today is advocate for the um, an ordinance that allows us to uh, put some teeth in some of our bear aware ideas so that we can um, actually take some action on some of the things going on in Girdwood. Right now, just as an example today, there's a, a dumpster at a condo that was over full, and if a bear had shown up, they would have had uh, a gourmet feast, assuming the garbage was good, which it probably was. Um, and uh, the, the condo HOA and the property manager, for reasons I'm not clear on and haven't looked into, are, are reluctant to lock it. And I think if we had an ordinance, um, a fine or two would probably change that reluctance to a, to a willingness. And so it's, uh, the ordinance is key, and the assembly, of course, has to do that in the assembly meeting. But uh, do we have an assembly member here today? Adam Zarr, liaison. Hi. Um, yeah, and it just, uh, this is working its way through the assembly, I believe. And uh, the, uh, I don't know what the nose count is right now on the, or the how it's working or how it's going but uh you know i think i think eagle river would probably be just as uh excited to have it as we are the, the areas are impacted a lot by bears so and, and bears are if they're not out they're going to be soon and uh, i don't i don't want to start feeding them right away because it's just a bad idea and i'll yield the balance of my time <laughs> i can i can uh Answer some of your question there, John, about where it currently stands. My understanding is there was a draft proposed last fall um, 
it got some pushback from uh, I think one of the two uh, commercial uh, trash companies, waste disposal companies in the Anchorage area. Um, and now it's currently going through staff review. I heard it was legal, we're still looking at aspects of it. But okay. I've, been pro I've been told there was going to be a um, uh, work session on it for the last month or so, and it's not quite happened or been scheduled yet. Yeah, I know. So it's goes. definitely slowed down. So I think yeah. you know, your comments are much appreciated. Yeah, I'd like to speed it back up. Yeah. Do your best to. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. I'm going to ask to just make a quick change to the agenda, if that's okay. We're going into old business, and I wonder if we could move up the item 14. Alex needs to get, doesn't want to stay all night. And it's really, these sort of things are things that we could have on a consent agenda, yeah. if we had a consent agenda. And so if the board, I'd make a motion just to move up item 14 to the beginning of old business. There, there may be another public consent as well. Oh, on the bears? I'm yeah, sorry. We do select public comment to the law. There's a motion made, is that you can say? But I'll second it. Okay. On paper? Okay. Yeah, okay, so move 14. Sorry, and I. Business. Back to public comment. Back to public comment. Aaron? <laughs> Sorry, Aaron. I'm always jumping in there. So, uh, <laughs> I'm putting on another hat. I, I, uh, I serve on the Girdwood uh, 2020 board now, Girdwood Alliance, and Girdwood Inc., in conjunction with Girdwood Alliance, is hosting another community lecture series, which is free to all community members. We try to culturally engage the community in a variety of different interests and experiences. So this Thursday, April 18th, um, at the Girdwood School, free admission to come see the Shiloh Baptist Church Gospel Choir. So hope to see you there. It should be exciting, fun, you know. I don't know if you guys have ever seen some gospel choir. But. Oh, and one more thing, if I may, uh, we should wish Elder Mike Edgington, happy birthday. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Yay, happy birthday. We would sing, but my wife doesn't let me sing. Yeah, it's, it's an achievement. <laughs> All right, would anybody else like to offer public comment? Brian, please. Good evening, Brian Burnett. I live up at the uh, top of the highway and I would just like to speak to this room and all of the uh, trails enthusiasts out in the valley that right now the trails are emerging from a coat of snow and they are wet and soft and please take care how you choose to recreate on the trails. Right now, even a fat bike can leave some ruts and trails that are gonna damage them and cause erosion for quite some time. At the Girdwood Nordic Ski Club, we've asked the residents of Girdwood and our visitors to please stay off of the 5K loop with, uh, with bicycles and, to, not, um, and to, to avoid any wet and soft areas of the trail. This also is uh, valid on all of the new trail construction we've done down at the, at the uh, mouth of the valley and any of the trails that are going through the forest, um, some time to allow the trails to dry out and harden up is going to pay dividends as the summer goes along. And we appreciate everybody's consideration with how they're using the trails. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else offering public comment? Hearing none. First item under old business. Agenda item LUC 1811-05, Spoons LLC application for a beer wine liquor license for the restaurant located at 174 Hightower Road. Hi, I'm Alexandra Fletcher. I live on Timberline. And I would love to add a beer and wine license to my business at, at Spoonline so we can start doing dinners and have a... Um, more opportunity for more employment and more options in Girdwood. So I'm asking for a letter of non-objection to take to the assembly. So I think we have in the back of our packet a letter of non-objection and I guess Mike gets to sign it. Yeah, so we just need to sign it to read it. We don't have, we don't have to read it? <laughs> So I would make a motion to approve a letter of non-objection for a beer and wine license for a spoon, spoon line. I'll second that. 
for any further? Uh, yeah, I'm just kidding. Um, um, and, and just just for the record, since it's down here, LUC did recommend that the GBOS pass this letter without objection. Uh, so any other further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Let the record show the resolution passes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And um, back to item number seven under old business review and vote on the bid proposal for the crosswalk light installation at High Tower and Alieska Highway at one thousand six hundred ninety-two dollars nine hundred and ninety-six. Could we call Kyle? I messed that up. One hundred sixty thousand nine hundred ninety-six. Um, how do I go about doing this? So talk and dial. Talk and then dial the numbers just as they are right there. You should be playing hold music to the radio audience now. <laughs> You're supposed to sing. <laughs> I'm sorry, we are not able to complete your call as dialed. Please check the number and dial again, or ask your operator for assistance. Try it without the 907? You didn't do nine, right? You don't need nine. Maybe that a one? Yeah, maybe that a one. Do you need a one? Do you do that one? Yeah. I doubt one. I think. I'll give it another go. Try it again. So one nine zero seven. I'm sorry, we are unable to complete your Try it without the one or the nine oh seven. Just try three five zero. Yeah. Hey Kyle, this is Robert at GBS Meeting. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Very well, thank you. Um, we are on agenda item number seven, the review and vote on the bid proposal for the crosswalk light installation at High Tower and Alieska. Okay. And at that point, I was instructed to call you, so <laughs> the floor is yours, sir. <laughs> Okay, so what is in front of you is um, uh, we need approval from the board to move forward the lowest bidder, which was simple construction, um, to start the project uh, this spring. And so uh, we've had a chance to discuss this. Um, I know that uh, many of you weren't thrilled with the price. Um, but it is what we're seeing, uh, as you can see in, in the bid document. Uh, the second bidder was only about 2,000 more, and the third bidder was significantly more. And uh, that's, the, that's the price that we're seeing for a system like that to be installed in Gerwood uh, at this time. Okay. So, and then just to remind everybody, the motion that we made on the 27th of March was tabled. And the motion reads, GBOS moves to approve an additional encumbrance of 19,000 and accept the bid provided by Roger Hickel Contracting. Because we need an additional 19,000 to go towards what we've already set aside, correct? Isn't it 19 plus the um, project management? Plus project management, yeah. yeah. Okay. So. so why, the first question so is, did you ever hear back from Chugach Electric? Is, uh, is Ryan in the audience? Yes. He is. Ryan, can you answer that question? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I did speak with Matrugas Electric and there's uh, $1,900 is what they want to fix the relocation that's at the intersection that's currently in conflict. I believe uh, budgeted we had 10000 yeah. when the pole used to be there. So uh, there is a, a little bit of a savings. Uh, <coughs> somebody took the pole out for us this winter. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us like how much of a savings? Uh, so we, we budgeted for 10000 the Their estimate is $1,900. Um, to do with some someone okay. with their crews. So they go after so. the person who ran the pole down and get their insurance to pay us the $1,900. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, um, okay. I could give a quick history. Just, you know, I know this is going to be a little bit of discussion. Um, so we started this project three years ago. And we asked the DOT to fund this themselves. The DOT came back and said, it wasn't warranted, nobody had ever been hurt there, so it wasn't warranted. It then took six, eight, ten months, I can't remember how long, to get T DOT to agree that we could pay for it ourselves. 
Then it took another six or eight months to get a something called a Torah, which is a transfer responsibility agreement, so that the the municipality would take over responsibility of that right away where we put the lights in. So that took a while. Then we got a roadblock from the union who maintains the traffic lights in Anchorage said they would have to maintain the traffic lights out here. And we have a union contract who takes care of our traffic lights, but this is a different traffic light. So we had to get them to approve, the union to approve that we could maintain that traffic light with our um, union electricians out of here. We then put out a bid for this project and last spring, and when we put the bid out, we got a bid back at $163,000, $164,000. We thought that was excessive. We thought maybe we'd put it out in June or sometime in the summer. We thought maybe we'd put it out in the winter. We'd get more bids. We'd hope for an electrical contractor. We put it out in the winter. Instead of one bid, we got first time. This time we got three bids, but essentially for the same price. Mike has done a lot of extensive research on um, how much it costs in other places to do this. It seems that we're these bids are excessive as compared to what it costs in other places. So I just wanted to go through kind of history, because this has started when I got on the board, which was four years ago, and it's still ongoing. Jerry, respectfully, I'd like yes. to just interject that we did have to do a redesign this winter. Yeah, like we're at that part too. Build, yes. build and not cost us additional funds. Yes, numbered. yes. So, you know, what we're talking about tonight is whether we approve the bid on this project, which we think the price is excessive. Um, you know, the question, I've had a lot of people since I've been approaching people about this project and they've come back with all sorts of ideas of how we should do it differently. The problem is dealing with Muni, dealing with the state, we have a process we go through. We can't hire a contractor from Colorado to come up here and put in traffic streetlights and things like this. So really what tonight we're doing is we're not talking about other ideas. We're just talking about whether we're going to approve this or not. Because these other ideas, dealing with the DOT is extraordinarily difficult. And you know, we know that from trying to change the sweeps as one process. So, you know, I'm talking a lot. Um, as far as the motion that you have on the table, could you clarify what the amount of money actually is? Because I think you said 19,000 plus project management. Can we? Put what I, the actual number is. I just read directly from the meeting minutes that had been approved previously, which said 19. I don't know that there is a motion on the table. Well, it's from the one that was tabled. Yeah, was tabled. Table. yeah it was a table motion. Um, I just would like to be clear on what the amount is for the minutes. Also, I wanted to make sure that you all saw that we did receive some public comment. We'd requested it from the trails meeting and also at land use. And so we received two comments, from one from Michelle Tenney and one from Julie Jonas, both of them in favor of putting the crosswalk light in, both of them noting that it's a lot of money, too, I think. And then um, you also received a comment from Aaron Boone, which at some point you'll probably want to, I think Christina has that. Mm -hmm. And I have that ready to read into the record when it's appropriate, Chair. Uh, sure. No better time than present. Okay. Uh, Aaron Boone sent the following comment. GBOS has been discussing this for approximately four years. We've heard from many people in the community that a crosswalk flasher or some other means of traffic control needs to be installed at the Hightower Egglock intersection. I haven't heard anyone in Girdwood who says that nothing needs to be done, although I'm sure there are some that have that option. I haven't heard any other solutions that would be feasible and effective and or that DOT would be open to. I do have some concerns about the safe implementation of a new system and the learning curve that will take place as kids will learn need to learn that they need to watch traffic even though there is a flashing light. A flashing light does not mean cars will stop, although this style of flashing light has proven to be much more effective than a standard crosswalk flasher in other cities. I definitely have reservations about the cost of the project, which has increased greatly since we first started discussing it. I also understand that sometimes it's the, it's the part of doing business and getting things done in Alaska. 
If I were at the meeting tonight, this vote would be a tough decision. I would listen to public comments and make my decision based on what I hear from the community and what the majority of the people want. I encourage anyone at the meeting who has an opinion on this issue to speak up. All right. That being said, does can anybody I, Sorry, actually, I, I, oh, yes, can I just ask a question about the motion? I'm not really clear what the motion is here either. So my understanding was the 19,000 only covers the um, cost of construction and does not cost the, cover the cost of um, I think the management. best thing to do would be to revise your motion. I think, um, sorry, Kyle. Yeah, you're correct. The project management is already encumbered, so this would be for, okay. for the uh, price of the construction. So the 17 and a half is already encumbered? Yes, and this, and this will be the price to fully construct. So this would be push buttons to each corner and, and you know, set up for both crosswalks. Right. And remember, within this, this setup, there is an add-on. So yep. um, you have the option to fund just for one crosswalk, uh, which would be the Western crosswalk, or you have the option to fund for everything and put push buttons at each corner. Okay. Can I, I'd just like to go back to my initial question because I recall from the um, from your report that um, that Margaret read, we only had about 140 or so incumbent currently. So I don't understand how an extra 19 can cover the 36 and a half that it, it, we have to add to that. We, we have two things encumbered. We have project management, which is separate. Okay. And we have 100 and whatever it was for construction. So that was just what was set up and covered for the bid process. And the bid came in, did have enough and covered for the bid process. Got it. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. Yep. So I'd like to speak to a little bit. So um, I know you said the you know the, the price is excessive. We've used the phrase the price is excessive. The price is high. You know there's an Alaska factor and things like this. I mean to put it into context, the most expensive solution I could find anywhere in the lower 48 um, was in Marin County. There was a lot of extra process. It was designed from scratch by Caltrans. So this would include all of the engineering design work, everything which we're paying about 240 something thousand for. And it was a more complex situation, much more complex than we have, and their total cost was 110. So we'd be paying about two and a half times what they paid in Murray County. Um, Portland, for example, put in a system which is, again, included an island in the middle, a lot of other work, curb work, and a bunch of other things. That was about 60. And we're, again, we're being charged, that was um, for the installation. So we're paying, um, was that 180 or so for the same thing? So when we say more expensive, we're being a factor of between three and five, depending how you calculate it. So it's significantly more, and it's just straightforward gouging. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, we've approached this saying we want it, we want it, we want it, um, with pretty much, you know, we don't care what the price is, and unsurprisingly, contractors are now charging us probably twice what they're really going to, what it's really going to cost, maybe three times what it's really going to cost, maybe five times what it's really going to cost. I think if, even if we go ahead with this, we should learn something from this exercise. And I think the thing we should learn from it is if you go into a project, um, you know, full on emotional, it's for the children, like some people have, I think probably before I was on the board, um, we're going to end up paying through the nose for it. We're going to end up doing a very poor job for uh, our taxpayers here. And we're not doing a very good job of representing the actual overall needs of the community. We may get narrowly what we want, but uh, we're not doing ourselves any favors for the future. I think uh, I like I think the point Carl made earlier. Uh, Carl made earlier about this is what it will cost in Girdwood. I think the combination of Girdwood being seen as a very affluent enclave who have money to waste, and the approach we've taken to this in the past has led to exactly this problem. And I hope, if nothing else, we never face this again by being more responsible in the way we approach problems. That's not a criticism of anyone in particular. It's something we've discovered through the process, but I'd like to at least learn from that. Um, well, I'll, I'll make a comment about the public comment that I've received. I've talked to over 15 people, and of the 15 people I've talked to, two of them are against it because of cost, and the other 13, 14, 15 were all for it. And so I have, you know, the majority of people that I've talked to are for it, even though they understand it's an excessive cost. Um, your comment about how we do it, I don't quite understand, but we can you know, work on that later, how we do it better. But you, know, you have a project and you want it done, 
I mean, I, I'm the one pushing this, and I've been pushing this for four years. And so, you know, people know that I want it because it takes a lot of effort, you know, to get it through the municipality, get it through the state. You know, I mean, I, I don't know how we do it differently. Well, and, and so, you know, if we had had an electrical contractor that had bid on it, it probably would have been less. You know, we all know it would have been less. We tried. I know, we tried. And we just didn't get an electrical contractor to bid on it. And it's, you know, as Kyle said, a lot of them are going out of business or combining with other electrical contractors and they don't want to go against the general because the general subs to them. And it's, a, it's the environment we're in. So, um, anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll see to somebody else. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Um, my comment is mainly for the community. Uh, I asked in my memo that was read at the Gerber Trails Committee to receive comments, and I did. I received two <coughs> comments uh, in support of the project. One actually had a request that the design include some sort of solar panel component to it for alternative energy source for it. So something for us to think about carrying on into the future. Um, but one of the other things that I did was I listened to the Girdwood Trails Committee meeting um, in which I heard uh, Jerry provide some additional detail and, and history to folks, but then also Kyle provided um, some insight on what exactly this means budgetarily. This cost is half of the annual parks and rec budget. I'm going to repeat that half of the annual budget for infrastructure. Infrastructure that we, because of all the things that we've done to take it away from DOT and have it ourselves, are now responsible for, for operation and maintenance. So that should somebody have an additional accident like we witnessed six weeks ago at that same intersection and take out this new costly system, we are on the hook to reinstall it. We're also responsible for any changes at the intersection as the Girdwood area plan moves forward. We have on the table active housing working group that are looking at alternatives to fund additional economically viable housing in Girdwood. And we know that at the end of Hightower and the end of Egloff, there are potential housing sites that could be developed in the future. How does that play out with putting in such an expensive system at that intersection only to have to change it in the coming years should that construction materialize? And then further, I just want to point out for comparison, the cost of doing business in Girdwood, we have later on the agenda $76,000 just to plan and design rehabilitation for our T intersection and all those potholes on Alberg on the way to the hotel. $76,000 just to plan it, just to design it, not even to actually fix it. And yet we've been able to leverage grants in the amounts of $107,000 to get the California Creek Bridge to connect up to Rowan, to, to then connect up to Carliolis for a trail that has a standard design courtesy of the Iditarod National Historic Trail, which is a federally subsidized trail system that already has gone through a planning process and that we're using interns to do some of the trail work as well as community members as an in lieu fee of labor. $107,000 for a trail through the woods to connect and yet we're also spending $76,000 just to plan for some potholes and some rehabilitation along the curves that go out there. That's the cost of doing business. So as we continue this conversation in the next year, moving forward with bonding options for little bears at the cost of $2 million, at tabling projects such as the rehabilitation of the ballpark there at Moose Meadows, for a future years because we don't have the money to get the drainage off of it and other projects, we're looking at mill rate increases. We're looking at the potential of having to increase our own quality of life uh, and fund 
these other projects because we continue to put in additional infrastructure that needs ONM, that provides us with a, a stable uh, working environment for budgets when we have to say we go to pay for this, but we're going to have to say no to several other projects. So just keep in mind that context that if we spend this amount of money and we set that bar for that type of project, that when we look at other ways to improve quality of life and other assets that benefit our children and our community and our recreation, the reason people come here for big weekends, it's the cost of doing business. Start getting used to it. Thank you. Um, any other comments from the board? All right, Tommy? I'd like to comment. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gabrielle Hessel, 25 year resident of Gerwood. I live on Stowe Drive. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for all the work that you folks do to help our community, for leading the charge on this project, Jerry. Um, it really means a lot to me personally because I'm about to admit that I am the flag lady. I don't know if. Many of you know that, but um, let's see, 15 years ago, my daughter was nine, and I don't know how many of you in here have children, but if you live in Alyeska subdivision, your child has to cross the Alyeska Highway once, come down the sidewalk, cross the Alyeska Highway again, just to get to the park or the library. So my daughter was nine, and I was like, God, how am I gonna do this? So I was like, you need to get off your bike, and watch those cars and push your bike across and then get back on. And I had a friend who said, kids can't judge the speed of a car until they're 10. And my daughter, she obeys the rules. Okay, fast forward, four years ago, this is just before this came on your radar, Jerry, my son, who's now 13, <laughs> he's nine, and I'm like, oh, I'm going through this all over again. The emotional parent, gotta let your kid go, they're crossing the road, oh my God, I hope they're safe. Traffic has increased in the 25 years I've been here. Cars don't stop. Have you seen a kid standing on the side of the road? They're not scared, but they have this look in their eyes like, are they gonna stop? Are they gonna? And then they don't stop, you know? And then finally they're like, okay, I'm gonna go now. And I was like, I'm sending my son off. How am I gonna do that? And then I was just like, I want to empower him to be able to keep himself safe. So I had this idea, I didn't know these existed in other communities. I had this idea of getting a flag, and um, I even wrote this little sign, and I said, you know, just stick your flag out and make, make those cars stop. And I see those, so I started with the Timberline one, and then I'm like, okay, I know he has to cross again. Um, so I set both those up, and then kids go to the Merc. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna put up some more on the other side of the road. We need two crosswalks. We never used to paint two. We paint two now, it really helps. So I installed these flags four years ago. There are other community members that are flag fairs as well that help me maintain them. I buy these flags personally. For spare time, not many of them disappear. They have a little sign at them that says, please do not remove. Our children are priceless. You cannot, we named our library, June. Have you seen the picture of the two kids we named our library after? Do you know how they died? Mm -hmm. You do, okay. Um, I, didn't, I don't want to name our park after, after a child in our community. I said, that's having this knowledge now, so I have helped contribute to keeping our kids safe, and I think it's our responsibility as a community to spend this money and get these flashing lights. These kids deserve this. And Okay, we're growing as a community. Yeah, we're gonna have more houses, more people, which means someday we're gonna have a stoplight. I am proud to say our town does not have a stoplight, but our children deserve a pedestrian blinking light to cross that intersection and get to the park safely and the library safely. Um, let's see, is Parks and Rec willing and supportive to use this money for this product? Like, is that something that like, I know there's only so much money to go around. Um, I'd be willing, I mean, are we willing as a community to, you know, it's like a family. You have a certain amount of money and you want to, you need a budget. Uh, you know, are we willing to give up some projects so we can have this? And whether we get 10 years out of it or five years out of it, if it helps a kid feel empowered that they can keep themselves safe moving around our community, I feel that our children deserve that. Thank you.
Can I ask a question? Sorry. Oh, sure. As you, as you, as you rightly said, the uh, the junction at the bottom of Timberline is probably worse in some in some extent because um, it's not uh, it there's is. not the same level of infrastructure. Yeah, and so, you know there's that blinking light there and the sign with the pedestrian. Nobody sees them. Nobody sees exactly. the fucking orange light. Thank you. Timberline is even the Timberline one is scarier. Yeah. So should that be our priority? We should we should get both. Uh, I think our priority now with the. Uh, the amount of traffic is this intersection here. It's in the summer now, and now that we put those things up in the middle of the road, that helps a little bit, saying pedestrians coming. Um, sure, it'd be great to have that. I'm happy to keep maintaining. I don't know if you, I, don't know, I look at these flags every day. They go across the street. I don't know if you've ever seen a little kid holding this flag. I've seen but that one. Yeah, you know, and so I think this one down here is a priority. Okay. Yeah. So one of the one of the things um, that's a concern when these have been used in other communities is that by putting them in certain places, it actually reduces and increases the risk of accidents elsewhere. People are now looking for these flashing lights at pedestrian crossings. Right. So if the result was it made that junction safer, but made the Timberline Junction less safe, would um, you still be happy with that? Uh, it's not that I would be happy with it. I don't think well, is it's that a reasonable price. I don't think it's going to make it less safe because when you go up the highway, it's just a road. Like we have the crosswalk there. Um, I don't think it's going to make people less aware. I think people are still aware of crosswalks. It would be great to have a light there. I'd be willing to take that risk. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Tommy, you had your hand up there for a minute. Did you want to speak? He's one. Of, he's one of the flag bearers. <laughs> um, uh, some people say, "Oh, this, you guys are being emotional, like that." That puts down the arguments that we may have that we care for our children. Well, you're being emotional about your children. I think it's really appropriate to show emotion about our children and, and about our children's safety. And in Girdwood, we do a lot for our children. The library here, we taxed ourselves to build it. The children's park. Um, the effort that we put into uh, getting a bond for our school. I mean, a lot of the things that we do here are for our children. Um, the pedestrian safety corridor, the bike path. Um, that was like five million dollars to put that in. A lot of talk, uh, a lot of suggestions have been made over the years how to make this busiest intersection in town more safe. There was an idea of a tunnel or an overpass and the research has been done and I credit Jerry with that, that um, that a flashing light that's pedestrian activated that's not on all the time, like there's a light there that is on all the time blinking and no one sees it. Um, when the city, when the state said it, that it wouldn't make it that much more safe for our children, I was there and, and I, I blew up at the guy and he had demanded an apology and I didn't give him one. Because, you know, come on. And I believe that no matter what the cost, um, it's really important to, to um, fund this uh, project. Um, I know of all the hoops, Jerry has talked about going through all the hoops, and the cost seems to be unavoidable. We're not rubes that just stumbled into the Bote company saying, hey, it's going to cost you, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's the cost of doing business in Alaska because of the contractors that we have up here. We might have to go get the Pope after Roger Hickel Company, you know? So you're going to go to hell for this, for gouging the kids and the parents in Girdwood. I don't know. Um, to give it a little bit of a perspective, I got this uh, letter from my credit union, and it said if I spend a dollar a month, if I, it's death and dismemberment insurance. If I lose my thumb, I can get $10,000. Just, you know, just a thumb. Of course, thumbs are what make humans humans, but I looked into actuarian tables. Americans' lives are valued at between $6 million and $8 million. Outside of America, they're less. So I'd like you guys to think for a moment 
about your own children or nephews and nieces or p children that you care for and raise your hand if you think that child is worth $170,000. No okay, we got two votes. <laughs> you got nicer kids, though. Thank you. I, yeah. I your apologies for any of my kids listening. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think that you guys should vote you for paying for this. I, you know, Mike. Uh, I mean, how much did the uh, tennis court cost? I have no idea. I wasn't. I two hundred twenty thousand. Some mm -hmm. Kyle knows. And that was because people wanted it and they put the effort into it. They came to the meetings, they went through, they jumped through the hoops. And even though, like Brian might have wanted that money to go to trails, it was decided that this is where the money should be spent. It's a jewel in the crown of, uh, of the Girdwood Parks and Recreation Department. Um, before you two got on, we voted unanimously to, to buy this thing, no matter what it costs. Well, the actual, the actual cost of buying the thing is 15000 It's the installation cost that's the 160 or, You know, whatever. I mean, the actual equipment is nothing. Yeah. So that's not I, I mean, it's, so, it, it's, I, I gotta tell you, I, on that earthquake preparedness thing the other day, I went, I was on the CERT team, so I had my helmet and my vest, and I walked down, and cars were going through there, the state says that the average speed through that intersection is 37 miles an hour. And there were two fire trucks waiting to get across the street. And, tr and there was a little kid waiting to get across the street. And the cars wouldn't stop for a fire truck. What we should do is add some flashing lights to fire trucks. Maybe that They sort of did <laughs> have flashing <laughs> lights. So if that didn't work, what's the... Uh, I know. I stepped out into traffic right. and stopped them. The bad argument is that flashing lights don't attract attention and don't result in compliance. No, that seems it's to be the opposite that, argument. It's that I hope you vote for this, Mike. Right. So um, you did say something about there was some the state one of the state traffic engineers said that that wouldn't be successful. I think there's no no question. no. He said that it, it was warranted, warranted right. that it wouldn't be get that much more safe. You know, you might lose a kid every once in a while. You know, like that. It just, it just made me irate. I think actually that the, the safety of Longbear has been improved significantly by adding sidewalks, making the road wider, putting a bridge across. These are all the things that really helped massively. I mean, and they were all fat and in better, you know, better, uh, better policing. I mean, the as you know, the the library is named after um, uh, a horrific accident. Uh, the bridge was, is named the after drink, a know, horrific the bridge, accident. The bridge walkway, the same reason. The Marlow Pavilion so, is named after a horrific accident. Right. And in many cases, we've done most of the things needed to, to fix them since. We've done a lot of infrastructure improvements, which have significant... This is the next one that needs this to be done. What? But what I was going to say was the thing about the flashing lights. This system, the system we actually proposed here, the, uh, the RRFB, is a rectangular rapid flashing beacons. And there's no question that they're really effective in what they do. There are some questions about what, what impact they have elsewhere, which is why I asked the question of Gavin. Um, but there's no question these are actually very effective at addressing, a, you know, they, there's a sudden flashing bright light, strobe light. They're very effective at, at grabbing attention. And that generally results in people slowing down and stopping. So I don't think there's a question about whether this is a good idea in principle, which was all the votes before, or a good solution. It's about whether we want to continue to be gouged in these sorts of things. Uh, which I, is a separate I, question. I, I want to remind you that unlike most Alaskans, Girdwood steps up. We raised our own taxes to pay for this building. We raised our own taxes to pay for the children's uh, park. We raised taxes to get police. Um, I, th I think that's the mentality here. We want that quality of life and we want the safety for our children. And we're willing to pay. And I think you're right. It's likely that with all of these incremental things, we're going to end up having to raise taxes here as well. You I know, think I, I think you could conclusion. convince people, and most of the, the comments have been in support of this, regardless of what the cost is, that people say, 
yeah, we, it's expensive, but we want it. I maybe think it's second, wonderful. Maybe when we do the second one at Timberline, we can get a more realistic price. There you go. There you go. Thank you, Tommy. Right? To the board here, um, I, I recall as we were discussing this going through land use committee also and there was fairly unanimous support probably six years ago for this project through land use committee. Um, but what I would like to say, speaking personally, my wife and I, we don't have any children in the Anchorage School District and we pay, Girdwood, we pay for kids to go to school. I do not have any children that are gonna be using that crosswalk, and I will gladly pay my share for flashing lights at that intersection. Thank you. Thanks, All right, any other comments from the public? So I'm Carol Fox. I think most of you know I'm related to somebody on the board. That's why I usually don't talk at these meetings. <laughs> um, you mentioned the thought that we would be wanting to be gouged by people if we vote to spend the or money. That they you that perceive that way. There are people who would perceive a vote, not myself, but who would perceive a vote against the crosswalk as endangering our children and be willing to take that risk. I don't think any vote does either one of those. Um, I have seen in the years that I've lived in Girdwood an increase in the number of things we do on this side of the highway that attract children over here specifically. When you talk about the intersection up there at Timberline, Kids leave the communities over there, they come down here, they go to this intersection, and then they go back and forth all summer long, <laughs> right out there. Not so much at Timberline. That's one of the reasons that I think we should do something more effective than what we have there. Um, I know that I have gone through that intersection and not notice somebody who has been waiting to cross, and I like to think I'm a pretty attentive driver. You know, I don't do that much up there at Timberline because there's less going on, I guess. I don't know. I don't like the thought that we would have to pay this much money, but I'd still be in favor of doing the crosswalk line. Yeah, that's my input. <laughs> Thank you. All right, any other comments? I'll just make one real quick because I don't think it's been brought up tonight. But, uh, you know, I've been, I've been, this is Eric Fullerton, in St. Johan Loop, Alaska Basin, section 14, lot number 27. Uh, so in going through, I, one of the first meetings I attended at GBOS, you were there, you were there, it was over four years ago, and it was right before you got on board, Jerry, I think, uh, this whole crosswalk thing started to come up, and I thought, oh, that's good, that's a good idea, yeah, make a tunnel, make a crosswalk, all that stuff, so, now I've been here over four years and I've, I'm actually kind of stunned that we haven't been able to, to pull it off. We're a small community, but I understand also the nuances and the, the difficulties you guys have to come up with. Um, I do support making it safer on our highway to have our kids at multiple sections get across the highway because I have small children and I've watched the kids carrying your flags and I thank you so much for keeping that up. Like it, it makes me smile every time I see them using it. And I get mad and stop people behind me like when you know I, I see that happening. So I think it's important we be good stewards of that as well and support when we can. The issue I have with this bidding process is that it reveals too many discrepancies between the individual line items of actual fixed cost items that probably should be consistent across the board between these bidding parties. And that's the biggest problem I have with it. I understand people have to add money to different line items on their bids in order to make money themselves, right? But there's not transparency when you have that much discrepancies on every single line item between the bidders themselves. So 
I don't want to delay the process anymore, but I want it to be known that next time a process like this is brought up and these bids are, are presented, it, it probably isn't about who has the, the smallest total overall. It may be as easy as going back to one that has a huge discrepancy on one line item that could reduce that cost $30,000. I see one in particular, which is, you know, like there's these things are like actual physical items that cost a fixed amount of money, and these contractors probably get them for the same price so that's the biggest problem I have is that there's there should be some sharpening of the pencils because this is a public document it makes it look kind of weird and it's not even about how much it costs like I don't think your question was properly worded that's why I didn't raise my hand it's like my child's worth way more than hundred and seventy thousand dollars I don't care how much it costs I just want to know that I'm getting the value for the money that we're doing and it's going to be effective that's all I have to say so I'll just comment on that. And the comment I'd, I'd like Kyle to answer. The problem we have with this, Eric, is that we get a bid. And they're asked to, we can't go back to them and say, let's sharpen our pencil and you're, you're gouging us for the survey, which we know they are, as an example. And or the junction box, or, you know, or whatever. It's a piece of but physical we, equipment. It, it, the way the bidding process works, Kyle, am I expressing this properly? Are you still there? Yes, I'm here. So the, the way this works is they provide a low bid and we either take it or we don't. I don't. There's no going back to them and saying, well, we don't like what you charge for surveying. We want you to lower that price. Am I correct at that, Kyle? That's correct. In this, in this aspect, it is because when you do that, then you have to go back to every contractor who bid it and see if they will renegotiate. But if that's saying feasible within the uh, in government purchasing, it, it puts a bid out, and, and if you're not comfortable accepting the price of the bid, then you don't accept it. If you are, then you move forward with the low bid. So it, it's a system we have to work on. Uh, yeah. 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 I understand we have some bureaucracy. unique situation yeah. up here in Alaska, but that's the, the visibility of what we see seems I a little agree. shady to me. That's yep. all. That, yeah. uh, we so. all agree. Okay. I think. <laughs> Okay, I think it's been discussed at length. There's a timer on this here from the time we called Kyle. It's been 40 minutes, so I'd like to move forward on this unless there's any rather urgent last comments. Okay, hearing none. Um, do I have a motion from the board? Well, we board have the motion, motion, right? We have a motion in place that was tabled. Yeah, a motion, uh, I make a motion to reinstate the tabled motion. I'll second. Okay, um, and that is for the approval of $19,000 and to move forward on this project. Is there any other further discussion? Um, I'll just say that I'm going to vote for this. The reason I'm going to vote for it is because I believe it will make it safer at that crosswalk. It's a one-time cost. I know it's excessive and I understand if people vote against it and I don't believe that if people vote against it, they're voting against our children. But I'm going to vote for it. So that would be the comment I'm going to make is it's uh I wish we weren't in the place we were. I wish we'd done a, you know, a variety of points in the process. I wish we'd uh, been a little bit more careful and a bit luckier in terms of the overall cost. Um, I think it's actually, you know, the solution we've come up with, the RRFPs are a really good solution. They're used in, there have been uh, quite a few of them are now used in uh, Fairbanks. So I know earlier on, I think there was, a, there was a comment in a previous meeting, this would be the first installation. There are actually a few around Alaska. Uh, Fairbanks don't pay this much for installing them either, oddly. Um, so there, there's a number up there, there's some in Anchorage. And I think this is actually a good solution. I really hate the fact that we're paying, you know, three times what it should really, three or five times what it should actually cost to do so. And I think it's, we need to learn from this exercise and this experience and uh, be more responsible in the future because we have not been responsible as a body in this process so far. All right, hearing none, um, I will call all those in favor. Zero opposed. Let the record show it passed unanimously. Thank you. You're welcome. For all those in Radio Land, it helps when we receive public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. 
Agenda item number eight, review and vote on proposal for planning and design of Arborg Avenue. Excuse me, before we move on, Kyle, do you need to be with the phone on the phone with us any longer? No, I'll stay through the next, uh, next three items. Okay, copy that. Um, review and vote on proposal for planning and design of Arborg Avenue pavement rehabilitation um, for $34,958. Uh, I would request that we table this. It's not a priority to have done this summer, so I would like to have a, a conversation here with Warren Lake uh, at the next meeting on this on this, this topic. Okay. Heard. Agenda item nine: review and vote on proposal for planning and design of high tower drainage improvements at forty-one thousand and seventy-one dollars. Uh, from from a maintenance and operations perspective, I guess this is a priority. Um, we are starting to see uh, uh, the asphalt breaking up in the section right across from the, the mercantile. Um, it's the first drainage catch basin from Alieska Highway down High Tower. And uh, the situation we have there is that the, is that the bump out and the, um, the slope uh, there is too low. And, uh, what happens in the winter is ice builds up behind that bump out and water can't get to the uh, head station and so it then settles and then over time traffic gets hammered at that location and as we've seen this winter, uh, it started popping on us. Um, we recognize this in the uh, original construction. We approached DOT to uh, take that bump out, out and make it a straight curve like it is uh, there in front of the condos. Um, and use the existing gravel shoulder as the sidewalk. Um, but uh, as we experienced, that was not uh, favored or uh, approved for change, and so we ended up with the original design build. So the, the request is to uh, create new plans to take out that bump out, make that curb line straight, and uh, install a, another head station further up the curb line toward Alieska Highway and will collect all that water that comes off in the winter. Uh, when the snow burns built up, the, the water cannot get off the road uh, as it does uh, in the winter or the summer. And so it all comes into town square. And so we're hoping that we can put a catch basin for the up the curve uh, on the existing sidewalk and then remove that bump out and uh, allow the water to easily get to both catch basins before it causes damage there to, to that uh, road section again. I need to address a conflict of interest to the board. Um, that's literally my parking space because I live at 150 High Tower, and it's that drainage that ices over my parking space every winter. I'm quite familiar with how much it fills up, and I am familiar with those potholes and a variety of other issues at that corner. So I just want to address that and let everybody know that I'm noted <laughs> and impacted directly. So if I need to abstain from voting on this, I completely understand. I do not believe that warrants an abstention. I'm looking at Mike over here. He's our, you're our expert <laughs> in conflicts. Uh, you get a private benefit, but I think everyone in the community gets that benefit, sure. don't they? Mm -hmm. When people use that junction all the time, so yes. I don't see it. Okay. I, I'm okay. Are we all in one more question, Kyle. <laughs> that, that money, is that coming out of the, um, the capital fund for roads? Correct. It's coming out of the capital fund for roads. Okay. And so everybody in the community knows this is just you know this is the cost of doing business like christina said this is just for planning to fix mm -hmm. the place where water sits down there across from the merc and we're starting to get potholes down there and it's the cost that isn't the cost of doing the project it's just the cost of planning and designing the project i, I do have a question probably for kyle unless there's someone from the Boutte company here um i know i'm looking at it. <laughs> on the on the cost estimate, the, the one thing I didn't understand is on the inspection section. It says field inspection two weeks, and we're being charged 144 hours for those two weeks. That seemed is it is it planned to be 12 hours a day for those two weeks? That's that's typically what we we'll do with contractors. They will want to come down here and get the work done as soon as possible. So they'll work 10 hours a day, well, 12 hours. Yeah, 7, 10, 7, 12. Okay. Get in, get out. So that that was what we were estimating. And is that two FTE? One FTE. Is it one FTE? That's just one that's going to Yeah, but that's 72 hours a week. Yeah. yeah. You got an Thanks. acronym. 
FTE. Full time employee. Oh. One person. Two. Got it. Usually surveyors are teams of two, and that's why I asked. Yeah. That's for the inspection side. Um, and the other question I had, Carl, was, um, and I, I, I looked at it the other day, and I, I, I think I see where the, I see the problem. I understand that problem. Is this is this um, intended to move the pavement? Or sorry, the sidewalk back. Um, all the way from the junction, or is it just moving that one, the secondary bulge? We're we taking out this that, that what we call the bulge or a bump out there. It, it, the the uh, intention of that bump out is to, to bring the pedestrian out so the, the drivers can see easier, right. as you'll see as you get closer to the picnic club or up that way. Um, and in this, in, in most of the time, that's because there's parked cars on the curb. So if the curves for the back, you can't see pretty well high parked cars. In this location, there would be no parked cars and not allowed within that area. Yeah. Uh, so we would move that bump out. It would be a benefit too, in the sense of, for example, when a greater blade goes through there, a uh, greater blade goes straight down the curb line to catch the snow instead of having to go out and around and leaving snow deposited behind the curves. And I know it's, it's early and we're going to get an estimate out of this process, but in terms of a general, general rough idea of how much the actual work will cost, so we're paying 41 for design and then what, 10 times that for the work or three times that for the work or what's the sort of ballpark I, I, I figure? It's very rough. I think, it, I think I'm, I'm guessing that it may be on a higher thousand. Okay. So 41 for design and two and a half times that for the actual work. Sure. All right, any other discussion? I'm just noting that there's utilities right there. So um, based on what we've heard from uh, Chugach, uh, just note that there might be a, additional cost there in, in the construction specifications. Always. Yes. <laughs> All right, do I hear a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve, uh, well, is there a resolution? No. I make a motion to approve uh, 41,071 dollars for the planning and design of the high tower drainage improvement to come out of the roads capital budget. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? And let the record show it passes unanimously. And then agenda item 10, discuss training for GBOS committees and subcommittees on Alaska Opens, Open Meetings Act. Just a reminder, next Tuesday you'll have a meeting uh, with uh, uh, Todd Sherwood and Dee Ennis from Memo and Eagle and we'll be doing open training act with you and um, ethics laws and you'll be having a joint meeting with land use, uh, public safety advisory committee, trail committee, and some other committee I'm forgetting about now right now. Kyle, you said next Tuesday. I think it's two, it's a, yeah, it's two weeks minutes. from tomorrow. Oh, two weeks from tomorrow. Sorry, yes, you're right. On the 30th, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And with that, the next agenda item is Gerber Forest Fair. So with that, Kyle, are you taking a leave? I can. And Tommy wants to speak here too. But uh, Tommy and I plan to meet next uh, Monday. Uh, we'll have a big Forest Fair. It's just finishing up. Uh, uh, some of the final things. Uh, one is the security contact. Uh, they're looking to hire more security guards this year uh, due to uh, struggle with getting volunteers help with security. So, so they're uh, working through all the different options there with the different security providers out of Anchorage. And then they're really dependent on um, other departments uh, to finish up their permitting. Um, uh, there should be like HLB, traffic, uh, noise permits, uh, things along those lines. So, uh, but yeah, Tommy and I have a meeting uh, next Monday, and uh, we should have, um, I hope by the next meeting in May, uh, through the majority of our permitting and, uh, and ready to go there. Excellent. Um, uh, thank you, Kyle. Um, the Forest Fair is, of course, a big event in Girdwood, um, and there, I'm the Minister of Paperwork for the Girdwood Forest Fair Committee. Um, I do the insurance permits processes, blah, 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 blah. There are 26 things that I need to get uh, 
to be given a permit uh, to have the forest fair. Um, I have been waiting on insurance uh, with a waiver of subrogation uh, clause in it. Um, we just received that last week, and so with that in hand, we can now file to the Alcohol and Marijuana Control Board for a state license. Uh, alcohol use permit for the Friends of Forest Fair Weekend and for Forest Fair uh, to the Heritage Land Bank for the uh, campground, uh, for the noise uh, permit, for the traffic permit, for a special event uh, permit, and uh, also for food vendor permit, which is a new one. So um, we had, I had 13 things checked off the list, and this is another nine, so that's 22. There'll be four or five. I'm not good with math. I'm good with papers, <laughs> but not with math. Um, so we're well on our way and ahead of schedule for permitting. Um, one of the things that we're going to do um, is to indeed raise the number of security people here. Uh, we are also working closely with uh, our police. Um, our traffic, uh, we are considering hiring a professional uh, flagging traffic uh, control people instead of having volunteers and we are renting a motor coach to bring people from Cars Huffman parking lot uh, back and forth to try to alleviate some of the traffic um, parking situation. Any questions? And I'll be coming before the board for a letter of non-objection Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's a piece of paper about this big. Yeah. Writing on both sides. Sorry, side. <coughs> yeah. So one of the, the, you know, the parade last year obviously didn't go, uh, had uh, an impact on traffic further back. Are there any, likely to be any changes to that this year, to the parade route, or, or ways to get more traffic, more people parking the other end? Because one of the problems is people have to come all the way through the town, to the top of the town to park, then come back. Yes, um, one strategy is that we're going to imply this year is we will close the pedestrian crossing for an hour after the parade is over. Um, this is to allow the cars to get back and forth because they're, that block, when the traffic is stopped for the time that the parade is on, it causes a chain reaction that we're, that's noted. So we're going to be directing pedestrian traffic uh, to use Murphy's Way. Um, Murphy's Way is um, a, a passageway under the bridge, and it's named Murphy's Way because his mama didn't want him killed crossing the road. So we so we had a secret solution the whole time. It's no secret. <laughs> um, uh, so we're going to be directing people that way and we're also going to have a handicapped accessible exception for people that are in wheelchairs to cross the road. So there will be a, a hold up right after the parade so people will not be able to cross unless they walk 100 yards up and then back through. So. Thanks. Thank you, Tommy. Next up is agenda item 12, LUC 1903-04. LUC recommends GBOS provide a new resolution support for the Girdwood Area Plan to state that the Girdwood Area Plan is no longer a subcommittee of GBOS and operates independently of government. Eric Fullerton. It's got to be summer. The guy's in shorts. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm here with Janice Crocker as well. We're the co-chairs of the Girdwood Area Plan. And um, this resolution is so that we can pursue new funding mechanisms and, and uh, be a more community grassroots effort towards getting a Girdwood Area Plan established. Um, any questions? Nope, I think it's been discussed multiple meetings. I'm, I'm, I'm just curious why, why the decision to remove yourself from being a subcommittee? Uh, this is, uh, it, there's several reasons. Uh, the main one is a funding reason. Um, secondarily, uh, we, we were starting to look at models of other subsets of the municipality and there's 
they're, they're all community driven areas that, that have done this before that aren't part of a subcommittee of a government organization. So um, being a government organization does limit us in terms of being able to cleanly accept funding and go after other funding sources to be able to um, advance the project to the, the second phase, which is what we're trying to do right now, which is ex much more expensive than what we just went through, which was about $20,000. We're gonna need about $80,000 to complete the entire project, yeah. So that's the primary reason. Uh, it, we're inside of this resolution though, there's built-in transparency, so we still plan on um, giving updated reports to land use and the GBOS, and it still has to be vetted through your um, organizations prior to going to the municipality to be incorporated in um, Anchorage's overall master plan, so. But there's also this sort of technical difficulty that we as a board of supervisors uh, are not responsible for planning and can't do work on planning. Yeah, we have some that we do. So it's kind of this weird, you have to kind of hold your nose and cross your fingers and stuff. <laughs> it's just simpler if they're separate. But normally this would be done by something like a community council, which isn't technically part of government, that's a grassroots organization. So because of the structure, it doesn't quite work. All right, I get it. I'll just make a comment. Thanks for all your work, yeah. the two of you. On. Yeah, Janice, did I miss anything? Okay. Uh, I just thank you for all the work you do on the project. Yeah, we hope to see you on the 29th. Oh, oh we got to make a motion. Yeah, do we have a resolution of support that we need to read in to take action on? Yes. <laughs> it's long. It's your birthday. Do you want me to read it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As a That's birthday the best present. present. <laughs> This is a resolution of support for the Girdwood Area Plan Update Committee as an entity separate from government to update the existing Girdwood Area Plan in accordance with municipal requirements for adoption as outlined in AMC 21.03.130, whereas the community of Girdwood has been operating under the existing Girdwood Area Plan since its adoption in 1995, and many of the stated goals of that plan have come to fruition while others have expired and whereas the community of Girdwood has initiated the groundwork for the planning process in the past including forming a Girdwood area plan update committee which completed a survey of the population in 2007 and meetings in the municipal planning director and original co-chairs of the G of the gap committee in 2015 when such planning was funded by the planning departments none of these efforts has formally has been formally adopted by the municipality of Anchorage as an official update to the Girdwood Area Plan. And whereas the Girdwood Area Plan Update Committee has originally formed as a subcommittee of the Girdwood Land Use Committee and the Girdwood Board of Supervisors in 2017, and has been working with the municipality of Anchorage's Heritage Land Bank and Planning Department to create an updated Girdwood Area Plan that has been eligible for municipal adoption. And whereas the Girdwood Area Plan Update Committee has approved, has been approved by the Anchorage Assembly through An Assembly Resolution 2018-176 as a suitable plan sponsor representing the broad public interest and having sufficient knowledge and skill to successfully develop the plan. And whereas the Girdwood Area Plan Update Committee requests a change in the relationship between LUC, GBOS, and GAP in order to achieve formal creation of an independent grassroots organization in which LUC and GBOS are stakeholders. And whereas the Girdwood Area Plan Update Committee will continue to provide progress updates to LUC and GBOS throughout the process development of the area plan and whereas this topic has been discussed in the, the Girdwood Land Use Committee which has recommended that the Girdwood Board of Supervisors write this resolution of support by a vote of 10 to 0 at the regular meeting on April 8th, 2019. Therefore, the Girdwood Board of Supervisors resolves their support for the effort of the Girdwood Area Plan Update Committee to operate independently to update the existing plan in accordance with municipal requirements for adoption as guided by Girdwood residents. Passed and approved by the Girdwood Board of Supervisors by vote of X to X on the 15th day of April, 2019. I'm gonna take your reading of that resolution as your motion to... Yes. Um, do I hear a second? Second. Any further discussion? Excellent, all those in favor? Let the record show it passes unanimously.
Agenda item 13, finalize agenda topics for the MOA GBS quarterly meeting scheduled for Monday, April 22nd at 4 p.m. in the Gerber Community Room. Next page. All right, and so far we have consider removal of cost for Urban Design Commission of $4,000 for trails projects. I like to keep that there. Okay. Um, status of code requirement of bear resistant trash cans in Girdwood. Keep that up. We all want to keep that. Yeah. Um, GBUS, how, me, GBUS updates on projects, housing working group with Mike Edgington, the T21C9 review of commercial parking requirements with Mike, and the cemetery schematic design and progress toward bonding in 2021 with Christina. Want to keep all of those? Yes. Mm -hmm. Any reason to, at this time, recognizing it might be better in the third or possibly fourth quarter um, meeting with MOA, but the potential for the little bears and the bond and going for bonding in 2020. I recognize that the update this evening reflected that we've got a little ways to go as far as like a 20% design, but even just a, a mention and remind them that that's going to be coming towards them. We could add it on. They're, they're aware of it. I mean, it could okay. be an update. I mean, we're working with them okay. on it. So the question that remains then probably is the fire and rescue budget 2020. I think, I think we should, that we've, we've talked about that in the past. I think we should dis continue to discuss that. I think it's a little bit different topic that you had in mind, wasn't it, Jerry? Or no, it's the same topic. It's just they're, you know, they have reorganized in Anchorage. Hmm. And so, you know, they're focusing more of their, um, the fire department um, on emergency services versus fire. And in doing so, you know, they had a very difficult time getting the union to agree to it because firemen like to fight fires and they don't like to as much be EMT taxed, you know, so. Yep. But they realized that, you know, that's where the action is. And that's so the reality. The reality of the situation. So they have changed, so I think we, just keep it on the agenda. I think the general topic is if the if the if they're acknowledging that's what actually has changed in terms of the the work, then when is the budget and the the, the tax raising power going to be changed yeah. to reflect that? So exactly. We can continue that discussion. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'd recommend that we move that as item three and then have item number four be the GBOS updates. Yep. Um, and I'd like to change the wording so instead of consider removal of the UDC review cost. I would say discuss waiving or yes. You guys good with that? Yeah. Um, or even just say discuss the cost. Okay. Yeah, to discuss waiving the cost would be good though. Um, and then as far as the fire and rescue budget, do you just want to say discuss fire and rescue budget again, or do you want to be more specific that you know with regard to restructure of AFD funding? I think we can be general. Okay. So stay out of that. Okay. From a Parks and Rec uh, standpoint, I will be attending the um, Trails Conference on Thursday and Friday of this week. And we did say that keep our ears open with regard to an RTP grant alliance or something. Um, I don't know if it's too ripe, but may I, if something does come up, may I make an amendment on Monday to add that in for discussion or? I don't think that it's necessarily, you know, the RTP is managed by the state. It comes from federal highways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure that it's the proper I know thing, yeah. that that's the right place. I think okay. that, you know, the uh, thing about trails is that they're impactful in different alliances and different groups. And I think that having all of those groups speak is, is helpful. Okay. I think the city and the state have their own conversations going on. They might not need that one, <laughs> but you know. Okay, good awareness. Thank you, I appreciate the feedback. Other than that, I'm good with the uh, agenda as proposed. Okay. Can I just ask, um, I don't recall what, I think there were more items in the last, the last quarter's meeting. So what are we dropping? What are we now done with? <laughs> I was, I was checking the, the, the website as well. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. I meant to do it before. 
Um, I can send you an email with regard to what we have had it there on the past, I think. I just want to make sure we're not, we're not missing anything we should be missing. And unfortunately, I missed that January meeting, so I don't have any notes on that. Okay, let's deal with that. Okay, why don't we go on and we'll, if we find something on that previous yeah. meeting that we want to add, we can add it. Sound like a plan? Mm -hmm. uh, new business, agenda item LUC 190404. Government Housing Working Group recommending a change in municipal code regarding ADUs. Mike Edgington presenting. Yeah, so um, if everyone in the depleted audience has, uh, <laughs> has the packet of I'm looking like a land use committee. It's beginning to look a little land use. It's appropriate, we've got a land use topic. So um, in the packet, I've got a, there's a long document with the details of what the new section would look like, but I just draw your attention to the table which precedes that, the Rev 3 table. So I'm just going to summarize, basically read through this table. So um, this was a, this has been a discussion for several months at, um, at the housing working group. So one of the things we want to do is um, encourage, one of the easiest ways to encourage um, more right-sized housing, have smaller housing units. Is to, um, is to encourage accessory dwelling units. So these are kind of legally conforming structures, so you can do all the stuff that legally conforming allows you to do. Um, and there are various restrictions in our code, uh, in our current code. Um, it used to be, it was actually quite a good, when it was first put in, it was pretty good. But uh, since then, there have been, ADUs have become more popular in other jurisdictions. We've, we've seen how they've been used more effectively in other ways. Anchorage revised their, their code last year and actually kind of leapfrogged us in terms of some of the features in it. So we went back and uh, reviewed where we were and came up with a set of uh, proposals. So this is the summary. So um, one of the current restrictions in our code is you cannot put a detached unit on a lot if the lot is less than 16,800 square feet. And what we're proposing is we don't put a minimum on at all, we remove that. Smaller lots is going to be very difficult to fit ADUs on in some cases. So we'll just let the lot characteristics decide rather than put an arbitrary limit on. Because there's no reason why a 16,600 is going to be a bad place and a 16,803 is necessarily going to be a good place. And any arbitrary line just has this same problem. So we're going to, we want to allow um, any lot that can hold a detached ADU appropriately could have one. Um, and so that, and that's also even smaller lots than 16,000. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if, if you've got an 11,000 square foot lot yeah. and it fits, if yeah. you have a small unit and the setbacks work, and the land use works, and yeah. More yeah, and you want to put a small thing on there. 50 or 60% of the lot is 50. I don't remember the cover of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so one thing is to remove that arbitrary lot size limit for detached ADU. The next thing is to uh, remove any minimum size. Um, for ADU, so there's no reason why we can't, you know, why they couldn't be tiny homes of some sort. There's a demand for it, um, so we'd see no reason to have a minimum in there. Uh, maximum currently is 750 square feet or 600, depending on your lot size, um, and 50% of the primary unit size. We want to, we want to um, widen that out to allow up to a 900 square foot unit and up to 75% of the primary, uh, primary unit size. So the idea here is some of the solutions or some of the things people have done in other communities and might want to do here is um, you know move out of your main house and move into the ADU it may be you are nicer uh, more appropriate to to the, the size of dwelling you want and then uh, you can rent out the larger house or you know maybe you have family you want to move or something um, this gives more flexibility in terms of the size again only if it fits in the lot in terms of layout and site and everything else um, parking currently uh, this is actually a difference between the way what we're proposing and the way Anchorage does it. In Anchorage, they say an ADU requires a parking spot on site. We don't have street parking, whereas Anchorage does in many parts of the town. So we've actually made it a bit more restrictive and uh, said that we need um, at least one, one parking spot per bedroom and two parking spots if it's over 600. Um, two bedrooms is the maximum for an ADU. Uh, there's a couple of technical issues in here about the way we use setbacks. Um, there was a, there used to be a restriction on how ADUs could work with bed and breakfast. We think that's kind of now, you know, moot now. Everything, you know, most 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 uh, 
rent, most short term rental is done through Airbnb, so we're taking that out. And uh, the other thing we want to make clear is ADUs are not dry cabins. ADUs are you know, fully functional, having the same utilities as your primary residence, or at least you know, having a full set of utilities where available. Um, the one thing I will point out in, in this draft of the code, we still had a maximal height of 35 feet. Um, we've done a little bit more research since then, and uh, it turns out that what we wanted to make sure was that people could put a, a detached garage with a full-size garage and a unit above and a roof steep enough to deal with snow loads in. Um, and, and our height limit would allow that sort of structure because we think that's a, that's a use plenty of people would be interested in doing. It turns out that actually 25 feet is probably okay to do that. And that avoids the problem of very, very tall secondary units appearing in house. So we're likely in our next meeting just to reduce this to 25 feet. Currently the, the, uh, the, the larger document says 35, but we're likely to propose 25. Once it's been through this meeting, we're going to propose it and have voting at the, uh, the LUC and um, next GBOS. It still has to go public pro through public process in Anchorage, so it's, still, it's going to go to PNZ. Um, there'll be a public hearing at PNZ, and then I think it goes to the Assembly for final, final vote as well. So there'll be plenty of opportunities to come into the future, but we would like any you know, feedback ASAP on this so we can get it right within this community and then present it to Anchorage with a yes or no. Respectfully, have you engaged the fire department about heights, etc., just to make sure their apparatus can the, reach certain things? The heights we have. What happened up at the house and the new right. development up there? The, how, um, the current limit is 35 for okay. any 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 uh, residential structure, with some exceptions, or any primary residential structure. Okay. So we actually want to reduce that a little. Yeah. Parking and access, making sure that right. a tender can get back there. Yeah. Okay. Question. Do you ever figure out what owner occupancy means? Not quite. I haven't got an answer to that. Okay. Thank so you. So that's a current work. restriction we have already had for ADUs. So we, we don't wouldn't be changing that, we're just uh, trying to figure out what it means. We're figuring out what it means. <laughs> <laughs> Agenda item and review PSAC recommendations of Whittier Police Department for police services contractor for contract contract period of three years plus two one year extensions. We have lots of questions. Oh yeah. Yeah. Keep going towards the back. So back there we have the group of policing options and you know what's pros and cons of each one. And then we have the contract, and in the contract, most things have been resolved. And in the last meeting we had, I think the one or two issues that were not resolved seem to be going to get resolved in the favor of PSAC, I think. I mean, the one, okay, if we go to page, we've got to think about this. Mike understands this better sometimes than I do, but page, I guess. Well, I don't know what page it's on, but the top of the one page where it says they suggest getting rid of section just that their mere response could trigger termination. Disagrees with suggested removal. I think this is something that the municipality of Anchorage yeah. wanted. So this is, it's, it's kind of historical because when we, when we first started this exercise, back when we were, um, when the troopers withdrew, um, the, they, the, current, the colonel at the time made some statements around the, um, you know, they would not, even if there was a major crime, they wouldn't provide any services. Um, so major crime services to, um, to Whittier Police when they were operating in Girdwood. Um, and I think since then, the, you know, there's been more clarification and, the, uh, and the, the sort of positions have softened a little bit. So this is kind of, I think this is less, I, I'm sure the language will stay in the contract. It's less of a sticking point than it was earlier. Okay. I know that was one issue. I have a question with regard to parking. Um, this is both a, a covered in Appendix A, um, page 17, add parking enforcement and presence at major local events to the substance of work. 
um, parking not included in this contract, and PSAC turns the item over to, to GBOS. Um, they, PSAC suggested that officers will endeavor to be aware of and prepared to provide services for major events in Girdwood, and yet, uh, if you turn another page or two to Appendix C, Parking Enforcement, Whittier's position is that, like the current arrangement, that Girdwood identifies problems, prints the paperwork, and we, Whittier, affix the, it to the offending vehicle, and then Girdwood makes the arrangements to t tow. And then some sort of WAG, additional parking duties of enforcement would require $120,000 extra on top of the contract amount. And it says that PSAC defers GBOS on this item as discussed earlier. So recognizing that we've got some parking code enforcement with MOA in, in development, where do we stand on this? So the, I, I can speak to this briefly. So the, um, this was, an, uh, I think, the previous chief. Uh, this, at does, does this yeah. smoke? I smell. Yeah. Yeah, I so smell. So is this just outside air coming in, or do we have? We are next to the fire department, thankfully. <laughs> what, are they, what are they doing? I think the board. There's the bonfire just across from the street. Yeah, I'm going to guess like that it's wood smoke coming in, but I mean, oh, it's oh, never good. a bad idea to look. Like. <laughs> but, <laughs> but while we have this little Probably break, I just want to remind you that <laughs> the topic of this particular item is that the Public Safety Committee is telling you that they've looked at all the information about the different options for policing. They looked at starting a Girdwood Police Department. They looked back with APD in a couple different formats and they looked at Whittier and and the main purpose I think of providing this information is to show that Whittier was responding and you know had ideas on how they wanted things to go we have a new chief now in Whittier he seemed a little more flexible on the parking potentially so I don't I don't know that you really need to get in the weeds on this tonight. This is just an introduction where the PSAC is saying